morning everybody and thanks for watching so I'm gonna go over a topic that I've been over many times before but it bears repeating because it's so very important and it's talked about here in Ephesians chapter 4 so in verse 1 Paul says I am entreating you then I the prisoner in the Lord to walk worthily of the calling with which you were called and then again in verse 30 of chapter 4 Paul says and do not be causing sorrow to the Holy Spirit of God by which you are sealed for the day of deliverance there you have it many religionists and Christians say Paul teaches that you have to walk worthily and you cannot grieve the spirit in order to be saved and they point to scriptures like these where Paul exhorts us to act a certain way because we have been chosen by God. But what they say is you must walk worthily and not grieve the Spirit of God in order to be saved or to somehow prove that you've been saved or in order to maintain that salvation. And there is nothing further from the truth than that belief. Paul does tell us to walk worthily and to not grieve the Spirit of God. But does he do that so that we will be saved or to prove that we're saved? or to maintain that salvation? Absolutely not. You would have to throw out everything he said previously in this letter and all of his other letters if you're going to maintain and hold to that falsity. Human beings are programmed in a certain way by God. In Romans chapter 7, Paul talks a little bit about the law that he didn't covet until the law came around and said do not covet and that produced within him all sorts of coveting the law came and the Israelites could not accomplish the law it actually produced more sin sin increased where the law came so by human inability when faced with the law it actually produces the opposite of satisfying the law that's why the Messiah Jesus came fulfilled the law and one day will write that law on those that will rule the world with him But the law said, do not covet, and it produces within me all sorts of coveting. Well, there's another aspect of human inability that humans are, are programmed to do, and that's the inability to produce fruits of the Spirit if those fruits are required to be saved, to prove that you are saved or to maintain your salvation. Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 5 the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit are a result of what has been given to us in Spirit. And I'm going to go over that exactly what that is here in a moment. But my point here is, I like to start with the bottom line. My point here is that if you look to any fruit as being proof of your salvation, as being necessary to get in the door of salvation, or necessary to maintain your salvation, that act will never be a fruit because it's always going to be something that needs to be done that you will look to in order to be saved not a result of being saved and there's a big big monumentally big 
even though it's subtle, difference in those beliefs. In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, this is verse 4, We then were entombed together with him through baptism into death, that even as Christ was roused from among the dead, through the glory of the Father, thus we also should be walking in newness of life. For if we have become planted together in the likeness of his death, nevertheless we shall be of the resurrection also. Knowing this, that our old humanity was crucified together with him, that the body of sin may be nullified. So the new humanity is spirit. Our old humanity of sin and death has been crucified with Christ. We have gone down into the grave with him. We identify with his death. Therefore, we identify with his resurrection. So we are a new creation in spirit, just like Christ is. So the sin and death no longer touches us in spirit. Of course, we're still walking around in flesh. We're still dying, even if we're still sinning. That's all part of the old humanity that has been crucified. So believing that we have been identified with Christ, that we participate with him, we're entombed with him, and we're resurrected with him, that's spirit. That's the new humanity. And it's something completely different than the old humanity. The old humanity doesn't exist and cannot keep us down anymore. And believing in spirit that we're a new creation, regardless of what the old humanity is still doing, means that you're walking in spirit and means that the old humanity can not touch that new creation because it's been crucified, entombed with Christ, and we've been resurrected into the new creation. So that's part of what spirit is. Galatians Chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. For we, in spirit, are awaiting the expectation of righteousness by faith. So, in spirit, we are awaiting this expectation of righteousness. The righteousness that was given to us by identification with Christ. By being entombed with him and being resurrected with him. That's the righteousness. Christ's very own righteousness, which is given to us. That's our expectation to come to a realization and to be constituted righteous at a certain point. That's our expectation. But in spirit, that's what we long for. That's what we believe. And that's what we are in the new creation. So hold that thought. Now 1 Corinthians 2.12 Now, <clears throat> now we obtained not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may be perceiving that which is being graciously given to us by God. So this has been graciously given to us by God. So to walk in spirit, we have to understand that there's nothing we can do to earn prove or maintain our salvation but it's understanding that in spirit Jesus Christ was entombed and we were entombed with him and we were resurrected with him and this is graciously given to us by God not by our acts to get it or maintain it so walking in spirit is understanding what Jesus Christ has done through his death entombment and resurrection and he drags us down with him and it all our sins everything that's bad about us our our death state the death process the sin drags it down with him in the tomb and then brings us up with him when he's resurrected that's where we get our righteousness and that is walking in spirit that no matter what i do or say or fail at understanding that in spirit I am a new creation and it's all of Christ. That's understanding spirit and walking in spirit. And only that can produce the fruits of the spirit. 
1 Corinthians 15.4 gives a plain explanation of the gospel. Verse 4 and 5, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was entombed, and that he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. He died for our sins, every sin. It's not us making a decision to earn it, us doing things to prove that we accepted Christ, or us doing things to maintain our salvation. Christ died for sin. His death destroyed sin. We did nothing. He was entombed. He was resurrected. He grabs us and takes us down and brings us up. And his righteousness, his act, is given to us freely based on nothing we have done. And we can understand that that's what we are in spirit no matter what we do here on this earth or in the flesh. Because that's dead. And that's the old humanity. Not because of us, but because of Christ. So I go back <clears throat> to my statement that no one can produce fruits of the Spirit if they look at those fruits of the Spirit as necessary for salvation or to prove that they're saved or to maintain their salvation because no matter what, it'll always be doing that thing that gets you something. Where if it's a fruit of the Spirit, it's a result of what has been done for you. So to rephrase, if having the expectation is the reason that you produce fruit and walk worthily, then the expectation has to be there whether you walk worthily, produce fruit or not. Otherwise, it couldn't produce the fruit in the first place. Fruit comes off you know, let's say it comes off a tree, right? The tree has to be there. Regardless of whether it produces fruit or not, the tree has to be there. The tree is salvation. It's a done deal. It has to be there in order for the fruit to be produced. You can't look at the fruit separately and say you have to do this you have to walk this way you have to do that and then put it on the tree no it has to come from the tree and it can't come from the tree unless that tree is solid and rooted and there and that's what salvation is it's solid it's rooted in there because it's based on the death and tomb and resurrection of jesus christ the fruit that is produced can only be produced when there's a guarantee that that tree is there regardless of whether the truth, the fruit is produced or not. It's got to be there. Whether the fruit is produced or not does not give you the salvation. The salvation is already rooted in the tree. So it is impossible to produce fruits of the Spirit or walk worthily in any, in any way if it's necessary for salvation, maintaining salvation, or proving that you're saved because humans will always look to that fruit as the source or a necessary component of salvation. It's only when you understand what Jesus Christ has done for you and that that cannot be taken away that you actually produce fruit. For example, if, you know, we'll pick a sin, stealing. Okay, stealing is a sin. So if you're saved and you continue to steal then people point out oh well you're stealing so you must not be saved you lost your salvation or you didn't do what was necessary to prove that you're saved so you're not saved okay then that person will always look to stealing as the thing to overcome in order to be saved even if someone doesn't steal 
and they say, hey, look, because I don't steal, that's why I'm saved. And that's not fruit. That's an action that they have done or overcame that saves them. So it's not a fruit of the Spirit. Remember, Spirit is understanding what Jesus Christ has done, identifying with his death, entombment, and resurrection as your righteousness. And if you look to stealing as getting or maintaining or proving your righteousness, then you will always look at that as something to maintain and do, and it can never actually be a fruit of what has been done for you. I don't know if this is getting too complicated, but it is a very subtle difference and, and very important that we have been graciously given righteousness and salvation by what Jesus Christ has done and understanding what he has done through his death, entombment, and resurrection. And giving that to us. Understanding that that's our expectation. And it cannot be taken away. Not by anything the world says, any religious person says, or anything we say or do. It cannot be taken away because it's based entirely on what Christ has done. Once you understand that, then you can produce fruit. Because the fruit is a result of of what Christ has done. And again, whether you produce the fruit or not, or walk worthily or not, that cannot take away the salvation that Christ has given you, the righteousness that Christ has given you, because if it did, then what Christ did could not produce the fruit in the first place. It has to be a solid root that cannot be taken away in order to produce fruit. If we look at Ephesians chapter 10, verse uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 10, for his achievement are we, being created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God makes ready beforehand that we should be walking them in them. The good works are created by God for us to do, for us to walk in. It's not something random that we do in order to get salvation. It's what God has given us along with salvation, walking in good works. It's all of him. He's doing all of this. And it's all up to him to bring us to where he wants us and to complete us and bring us as far as he wants to bring us until it's time that we are constituted righteousness, that we are delivered from this body of death and sin to the <clears throat> glorious expectation that we have in spirit. And the spirit believes and knows that it's the death and participating in that death, being entombed and resurrected with Christ Jesus that gives us our righteousness.